All right, welcome back for session two. I hope everything runs as expected for you. Please let us know if we can be of help to answer your questions. Don't forget to rate the sessions you're attending. It's important for us to collect your feedback in order to improve the experience for a future virtual event. During the different sessions this afternoon, you can use the chat window to share info with other attendees and to ask questions. Please use the dedicated Q&A tab to ask specific questions to the speaker. We will try to cover a few of these questions at the end of the session. And don't forget to have a chat today with one of our partners. So now it's time for our next speaker. Peter Himschot will get you up to speed how to generate super efficient code with reflection and expressions. Enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, I'm Peter Himschot. I work as a trainer and architect for UTU. And let's have a look at what we're going to discuss in this session. So one of the things that I want to do is I want to start with an example problem. And in this case, I'm going to talk about the concept of value objects. And I want to implement these things really efficiently. And there are several options in how I can implement something like this. I could just hard code everything. We could use reflection. We could use .NET expressions. And the target of this talk is, is to show you how you can actually generate on the fly very efficient coder that has nearly the same performance as hard-coded uh, coder, but in that case, you don't have to do all the work. So let's start with the domain itself. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of value objects. In domain-driven design, people talk about a couple of concepts, and one of that is called a value object. A value object is an object that has state, but it does not have a real identity. For example, if I were to give you a 200 euro bill, would you care which bill I'm going to give you, the left one or the right one? Well, in that case, you just don't care. And in .NET, we can use .NET structs to implement the value object. We can use enumerations, but we can also use classes. And in domain-driven design, actually, a lot of people like to use classes because it has a couple of advantages. Now, when are two value objects equal? Well, they're only equal if their full state is equal. 200 euro is equal to 200 euro, but 200 euro is not equal to 200 dollar. So the amount and the currency has to be the same. So it means that we have to implement equals for these value objects to actually compare every property in that object. Now, value objects have another concept, namely that they generally should be immutable and that just makes it very easy to share these objects to pass them along and you can do a whole bunch of optimizations generally known as the flyweight pattern now i'm not going to talk about immutability but i do want to talk about equality now how can i implement the equals well of course i will have to override the equals method and things like get hash code and maybe the operators but what are my options Option number one, I could just hard code everything. Option number two, I could use the technique that is prescribed by Microsoft. I could use reflection. There's an implementation of value object from Jimmy Bogert, also known from Mediator. Uh, and finally, we could, and that's kind of going to be my demo, look at how we can implement equals just once and then have almost no maintenance, but still have a very fast code. So let me switch to my Visual Studio. And here I have like a hard-coded object. Now I want to show you this has like three properties. And I'm going to say that this hard-coded object and just ignore the, the concept of the properties itself is equal to another one only if the first name and the last name and the age are the same. So if I want to implement it, I can then do that using an override of the equal method that I'm inheriting from object. Please note, I am using not uh, nullable reference types from C Sharp 8 in this demo. Uh, but again, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. So what I'm going to do in the equal is first of all, I'm going to see if this reference is equal to the reference of myself. If so, then it's true. Otherwise, I'm going to see if the object type is equal to my type and if it's the same type i can then cast it to my type and i can then call 
another equals, namely the one from the I equatable interface, which I do recommend implementing all the time. And then here, what we can do is we can then simply check is first name equal to the other, is last name, and is the age uh, the same. So pretty simple to implement in a way. In many cases, you can almost copy paste everything, but it does have an advantage. It does have a couple of disadvantages. The disadvantage mainly is if I have 500 classes that are all value objects, I will have to maintain 500 equal methods. And if I add a new property to this class, what's the chance of me forgetting to update the equals? If I add a new property, this will compile perfectly, but my logic is now flawed because it doesn't use the new property anymore. So I would like to avoid that. So how could we make that easier? Well, let me show you another class. Microsoft on their website shows you how you could actually build a class. And let me show you the class first. And this class is going to inherit from the value object from Microsoft. And then in here, what we do is we need to implement equals. And in the equals, we need to override this method that will return all the values of all the fields. Of course, this makes it easier to implement equals because the only thing you need to do is to override this method and then return the property values. But it's kind of still suffers from the previous problem. Namely, the problem that if I add a property, I have to update this as well, and there's a chance I might forget. So we could actually look at another technique. And what is this technique going to look like? Uh, so this was the Microsoft technique I kind of showed you. But what I can also do is I could use reflection. And I think a lot of people will probably already have been using reflection a little bit. What is reflection? It allows you to ask of a certain object, please, can I get your type? And then I can ask, what are your methods? What are your properties? What is your base class? Do we have this interface? And we can also use it to dynamically invoke a method. Could you please call this method with these arguments? Could you please get me the value of this property? Could you please set a property? We can even use it to dynamically create objects. Huh? And a lot of people use this kind of reflection to add extensibility to their application. I mean, adding functionality without actually having to rec recompile anything. And there are a lot of examples. For example, JSON serialization, uh, there are implementations out there that do this with reflection. What does reflection look like? Well, typically what we're going to do first is we're going to ask our type, hey, what's your type? Uh, for this, we have the type type. Uh, and then once we have it, we can then access all the methods, all the fields. Please get me all your properties. Please get me this method. Uh, now, reflection is pretty powerful. And if you want, you can actually disable reflection in your code, but most people don't do that. Uh, you can do it by disabling the reflection permission. But since I want to do reflection, we're not going to cover that part. So let's have a look at how I can implement reflection. So what I have here, again, is a base class, reflected value object. And here I'm going to implement e equals again. And this looks very similar to the hard-coded version, but this is the one on the base class to start with. And then in the equals itself, what we're going to do is we're going to use reflection. And I'm going to say, please, if it's the same reference, then I'm done. I know it's the same object. But then I'm going to ask for the type. And then I'm going to see if the other object's type is equal to my type. Then I can ask, give me all the properties. So I can call this method called get properties. And I can ask it, please give me the public properties, which are instance properties. And then for every property, I can say, give me the value of this property on the left object. Please give me the value of this property on the right object. And then if the left is an object, and this is a syntactic sugar for saying if this thing is not equal to null. So if left is an object and left equals the right object, we're going to continue. Huh? And if that all works fine, I'm going to end this loop and then I can return true. Otherwise, if one of these is not equal, I can return false. Now, doing this kind of implementation does result in a very simple implementation for an object that inherits from this. What do I need to do? As you can see, nothing. 
I don't need to do anything to make this work. Since I'm going to be inheriting the equals method, and the equals method is going to walk over the first name property, the last name property, and the age property, I don't have to do anything. So this is very nice for maintenance. But what about speed? One of the things that I have done in my project is I've added a performance session. And with this, what do I mean? I've added an executable and I've added a reference to benchmark.net. If you're not familiar with this library, this is a library that allows you to do very precise measurements on how long a certain operation takes. And what do I need to do for that? Well, you just need to write a class. So you write a class and then in this class, you can then add methods and you can say, hey, I would like you to benchmark this method. So what I've done is I've created a couple of methods. Some of them will simply compare uh, an object with the same reference. So here I'm kind of saying, is this reference equal to the other one? It has to be, or uh, we have a problem. Uh, by the way, the way that I'm doing things is uh, I'm also kind of creating my objects and I'm double checking that my assumption is correct before doing the performance session. Uh, doing performance sessions on faulty coder is useless, but this way I know that this is going to be equal to the other one and the other one is not going to be the, uh, and so on and so on. Okay. Um, so when I run this session, I can then look at the precise measurements. Sorry, I'm not going to do that live. Why? Running this easily takes 10 minutes. So what I've done is I've done my homework and I've prepared it. And then if you look at the performance difference, for example, if I compare a hard-coded object or a Microsoft implementation or one that uses reflection using the same reference, we see if you have exactly the same speed. Why? Because they're all using object reference equals. But then if I use my hard-coded equals, which compares first name, last name, and age, I see that I get like six. If I then do the same thing with the Microsoft uh, implementation, we see that we suddenly get, whoa, this is a lot slower. And then if you look at reflection, we see that it's even way more slower. So this is like 600 times more expensive using reflection than just using a hard-coded method. So conclusion kind of should be, huh, reflection is really slow. And that's what it is. Doing reflection is not bad, but it's slow. So how can I use reflection efficiently by just doing it just once? What you want to do is you want to walk over your call using reflection and then cache as much knowledge as you need as possible in, in some data structure. And then from then on, use that data structure. Or even better, what I could do is I could actually do reflection and generate code on the fly using reflection. So after doing the reflection, I can just call my method. And then what do I get? I get, I get native performance. Uh, the compiler will just, the JIT compiler will just generate for me the, the native code and it will just run with native code speed. And that's the technique that I want to show you. But before I can show you this technique, we need to talk a little bit about the concept of expressions. And for this, I have another demo. And you probably will recognize the code in this demo. Why? Well, what I'm doing is I'm actually creating, uh, sorry, I'm actually creating a DB context object. And then I'm using link to talk to this DB context object, okay? Now here I'm using the method syntax of link. I could have used the query syntax, but if I'm going to run this application and let me do that, what you're going to see is, is at a certain point in time, it goes to the database and it will generate this kind of query. And if you can see, it does a select ID, name, value in Euro from a table called currencies. And then I'm saying where the ID is equal to one. Now, I did that because in my link query, I'm asking it, please find me an object with ID equal to one. Okay, so let me run that again, but now with the debugger. I want you to realize that this method takes this Lambda, right? And you might say, oh, that's a Lambda function. Well, in this case, that's not really true. What I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in a bit on the where method. And if you will look at that where method, 
you're going to see that this is a method that belongs to the queryable class of link. And this queryable class, if you look at where again, you will see that it takes as the first argument an iQueryable object, and it takes as the second argument something of type expression. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my code a bit, and I'm going to turn this into an expression. And what, what do I need to do is I'm going to create an expression type, which is built into .NET. I didn't have to do anything for that. And then, by the way, this is a generic class, so I'm going to add the namespace, syslink.expressions, and then I have to give it some delegate type. And in this case, what is this going to be? This is going to be a function, so I'm going to use func, which is going to take a currency object, and it's going to return to be a boolean. Let's call that test. And guess what? I'm going to move the code in here, over there, and I'm going to make this test. And you know what? Just to prove that I'm doing exactly the same stuff now and just made my code a little bit longer, if I run that one again, you're going to see that I get exactly the same query. I want you to realize that if I do this kind of stuff, and if I use the debugger, I can actually look at the test object. Let me go for the debugger. If I hover on top of this, I can ask the system, please show me what's in here. And I'm going to use quick watch. And sorry, the font might be a little bit small. I hope you can read it. But if you're going to look at this, you will see that this is an expression. And you will see that the body contains something called a logical binary expression, which is actually going to be the equal statement. And then if I look down inside body again, you will see that on the left, it is actually using something called a property expression because the left side says currency.id. So it's getting the property of a currency object. And on the right side, you will see that I have like a constant expression with the value of one. Now, this is actually a tree-like structure. This is an object containing an object, containing objects, containing objects in a tree-like structure. And then I can actually draw that. So guess what? I've done that on my slide. So uh, if I have an expression like this, where I'm saying, please look for an object with a certain property equal to a certain value, what happens is the compiler at compile time actually builds for me a tree that looks like this. And guess what Link will do? Link will turn this into some kind of query language. And if I use like Link to SQL or Entity Framework on top of SQL, what is going to happen? It's going to just walk that tree and it's going to convert everything from this c -sharp object into SQL syntax. So, okay, question, how do you write equal in SQL? Well, that's easy, that's just equality, okay? Now, another one, how do I write this property, person.h in SQL? Well, in that case, you will probably have to know that person is a class that gets stored in a table. Maybe that table is called people or something. And then the property is a column of that table. So what we can do is we can say, please, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, we can then simply say, get me the column with uh, age of table person. And how do I convert 32 into SQL? Well, that again is easy, it's just 32. So what happens is this whole tree-like structure gets converted into dbo.people.age32. And guess what? This is an aware statement, so it adds a where statement. And this is conceptually how link to whatever works. This tree could also be converted into another query language. Query languages like Camel for SharePoint. Uh, okay, so that's basically the idea. Now, I also want you to realize that this tree-like structure can also be built you by you yourself at runtime. So again, what I'm going to do, and uh, it looks like this is still open, so I'm going to kill it or just use the debugger to stop it. What I can actually do is I can write some code that will dynamically generate for me an expression. And guess what? If I look at expressions, you can compile them. So for this, I have a bit of code. What does this do? It's going to build for me a function that takes an int, another int, and returns an int. And I, I wanted to make it real simple. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, this is going to be a parameter. A, this is going to be a parameter B, 
Uh, so I'm going to create something called a parameter expression. This gives me an object that represents a parameter of type int with name A. Same thing for the next line. This will create for me a parameter called B. And then I'm going to say, please give me an expression that will add the first parameter to the second parameter. So now I have an add expression. And now finally I can say, please take this add expression, pass in these two parameters, A and B, and then convert it into a lambda expression. And once you have a lambda expression, you can compile it. So this will actually return to me a delegate that will add two numbers together. Before I actually show you that, let me show you maybe another thing. If you're going to look at expression, this type, you will see that there are a whole bunch of static factory methods to create things like give me an add, give me an add, give me an array index, give me a block statement, give me a break, give me a condition, and so on, and so on, and so on. I don't know if you see it, but this is what you also find in c -Shop. Expressions are actually a tree structure that can take any c -Shop statement. And guess what? Once you have that c -Shop statement into an expression, you can turn that into an invocable lambda by just calling compile on it. And again, let me do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this bit of code. I'm going to paste it in my program. I'm going to drop it right here at the end. Oops, something went wrong. Let me try that again. Copy. Paste. Ah, and of course, uncomment the caller. So I'm asking it, please build me dynamically a function that can add these two numbers together. And I'm just going to call it with five and four. And what is that going to print out? Well, let's just have it running and it will print out nine. Okay. And this is a technique we could actually use at runtime. We could combine this with reflection. We could use reflection to figure out what kind of expressions we're going to build. And then later we can then compile those expressions and we can then just call them. And from now on, I have as if it was hard coded, uh, as if it was hard coded code. Okay. So these expressions allow me to do that. Now, back to my previous demo. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick another branch. Uh, by the way, I'm going to give you my coder at the end so you can play with that. So what I want to do is I want to show you, for example, a version of my object compare. Uh, and then in here, one of the things you're going to see is that I have like my own value object. Now, what I'm doing here in this value object is it's very similar to all the rest, except the equals actually gets delegated to a generic class. It's this generic class that I'm going to show you how to build. So this value object compare will build for me an equals method for whatever this is. Okay, so that's part one. Now, if you look at the value object compare, you're going to see that this actually will build for me a comparison function at the runtime, type comparer, and then I have an equals method. And what does the equals do here? Well, same thing. If I'm getting a reference left and right, which are the same, then it's true. Otherwise, I'm going to check that left should be not null, right should not be null. And then if neither one is null, uh, sorry, if both of them are not null, I can then call my comparer function. And this is what I have still left out in this little demo. Okay. So with this comparer, we can already get, uh, sorry, with this kind of implementation, we can already do a lot of stuff. To clarify things a little bit, what I've done is I have a little table here. If left and right is null, this will return true. Why? Object reference equals will return true. So this already makes sure that this statement can never have both left and right equal to null. So if the left is null, this will return false because this will return false and we have ands. Same thing for the right side. If this right side is null, then this part will become false and the whole thing becomes false. And then if both of them are not null, so I'm checking that again with if left is an object, so it's not null, right is an object, so it's not null, then I'm going to ask the comparer to do the comparison. So that's step number one. So my value object really delegates to this object. Now, I again want to mention one other thing. 
What I'm doing here is I'm using the singleton pattern to make sure that I'm only going to have one instance of this class max. Why? Because I want to avoid creating this comparer more than once. This comparer is going to be using reflection. And then because this is a singleton, this constructor will only create a comparer just once. Please note, I still have to do that bit. This bit is not complete yet. So let's go for the next part. So what I'm going to do is, again, I have a branch that has a little bit more color. Uh, I'll force it. And then what you're going to see is, now the comparer gets filled in by what I call the expression generator. So this one will actually generate for me a comparer for whatever T is. So if I pass in my value object, this will now generate a comparer for my value object. And again, let's have a look. Uh, here's the expression generator. And again, this is only halfway done because I want to go through this step by step. What is the comparer going to do? Well, I'm actually going to uh, walk through every property of my type. So this is going to get my value object. So it's going to have a first name property, a last name property, an age property. I'm going to walk through every property here. And then what I'm also going to do is I'm going to ask the comparer to create for me an equality expression that will compare left, right, and a property. So this part here kind of says left property equal right property, or in the case of my value object, left dot first name equal left right dot first name, or left dot age equal right dot age. So it does that. Now, in order to be able to do that, I need to give it two parameters, one for left and right. And I do know that the left parameter is of type T, the right parameter is of type T, uh, and then I'm going to walk through it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a list of comparers. So at the end of this statement, this comparer will have three elements, one for first name, one for last name, and one for age. And then the only thing I need to do is I need to kind of make one big and. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm going to use the and also operator, which is actually the C-sharp equivalent of this. And I'm going to say, please get me the first property that should be equal and also the next property should be equal and also the next property. So if I'm going to run this with my object, you will see that I'm going to have like three ands, sorry, two ands with three objects, three comparisons, uh, one after the other. And then I'm going to compile this into a compare. So this thing actually gives me a nice equal statement, kind of literally the equivalent of what I'm doing in my hard-coded value. I'm going to dynamically generate this kind of code. Okay. Now, again, I'm not done yet. So let's go on to the next step. And for that, again, I have a branch. Okay. And now I can open up expression generator again. And now we're going to end up with the bulk of the code. What am I doing here? I'm going to generate an equal statement between something left, right, or a certain type of property. Now, how do I, how do we normally do that in Coda? Well, in Coda, you would say left dot equals right. That's the basic simple concept. And that's literally what I'm doing here. I'm asking my coder, please get me the type of the property please get me the equal method for this type. So I'm asking it, please give me the equals method for this type of property, for example, string equals, and then the equals method that takes an object. So this is the base equals method from the object base class. And then I'm going to turn that into an equal call. I'm going to say, please build me a call statement that will call equal on the left property value and the right property value. So get the right property value uh, for that property. So again, if I'm doing this on my value object and for the first property, uh, first name, this is going to be string. It's going to get the equal method for string. And then it's going to call the equal method on whatever the left property is, the left first name and the right first name. 
Now, at that point in time, you might realize that this might be null. So we need to maybe add an extra check. Now I can ignore the check if I know that my property is a value type. A value type can never be null. So in this case, if I'm going to say, hey, are you equal? I can just call the equal. But if it's a reference type, I will probably have to do things again, like make sure that left and right are either both null or neither null, and then we can call equal. And that's what I'm doing over here again. So I'm building an expression to get the left value property, the right value property. I'm going to tell it, please, could you compare if they're equal? Huh? by comparing the references then i'm going to compare it to null so i'm going to create a constant with value null and i'm going to have a statement that will say it should not be null uh, so this is literally not reference equals null and then finally if that is true i can then do things like hey if the left side is not null then we can call equal so again this is quite verbose to write but really not that hard and then we can look and you should see that this is kind of being the equivalent because at the end I'm saying either the reference is equal or the left is not null and is equal. So this is the or statement that I have. Now you might say, hey, this, com this code looks quite complex. How do you build something like that in real life if you don't have the code already? Well, of course, we need to call the equal now. And the easiest way that I find in doing that is what I've done is I created the test project. And in my test project, I'm actually going to call some of these methods. And what I've done is I've created two objects which are equal. And I'm actually going to call the equal statement on this. So let me put a breakpoint right here. Now, I know that this will call my value object equal. Uh, and then this will actually call the instance. So what I'm going to do is again in my value object comparer, whoops, this one. I'm going to set up a breakpoint. Uh, and I'm actually going to set up a breakpoint when it creates this object. So I'm going to say, please stop on this statement when you create me the comparer. And then inside this method, I'm going to have a breakpoint as well. And let me add another one over here and it's already there, okay? So once I'm there, I can now use things like Test Explorer and I could say, please, I would like to debug one of these things. So I'm going to say, I would like to debug this. So let's hit debug. Let's make it run. And maybe with a little bit of luck, we're going to end up where we want. So I'm going to step into F11. So we see that we go to the value object comparer, which will get the instance first. So if I step into there, we see that it will create the comparer. So it's going to call this generate comparer method again. Let's step into that. And then we're going to walk over our uh, property. So for every property, we can now do things. And again, let me go full screen so you can see a little bit more. So now I'm getting a property, wait a moment, uh, which is going to represent first name. So this is the property info for first name. So I'm going to say, please generate me an equality expression for something called first name. And then if I step into this method, we're going to get the type of the property, which is going to be something of type string. I'm going to say, please get me the equal method for string. Please get me a call to, to call the left value and the right value if they're equal. String is not a value type, so we're going to do the other statement. Please, left should not be null, right should not be null, or they should both be null. And then we do everything. And this will now return to me a comparer object. Uh, now, if I do that again, we'll end up with uh, another property, again, of type string. This is now the last name. Let me repeat that one more time, and I'm going to step out of this method. Uh, and then we're going to enter this one more, and we'll see now that this is going to be of type int. And now we're doing that for h. Uh, oh, and because it's h, it's a value type, so we don't need to bother checking for null statements. Now, let me continue running. So now I should have three comparers. One that will compare left first name equal right first name, and another one, and another one. By the way, you can see that expressions, when you look at them in the debugger, they nicely show their value. Okay? 
So I'm now going to aggregate that into one big AND statement. Uh, and then if you look at this AND, you will see it's way too big to read, but this is just like first name should be equal to first name of the other object and so on and so on. And then we're going to compile it and now we're getting a Lambda. And I'm just going to step through that. And this comparer is now the Lambda. So that works. Now, let me step into this one again. And I want to show you something. Uh, if I walk over it, it actually did not go into generate comparer again. This is a generic class, which is a singleton. This constructor only gets called once. So the reflection is done just once. So I get only one small time, a little performance hit, but from then on, I can call this comparer directly. And guess what? This already has been JIT compiled into native assembler. So this works now really, really fast. So if I stop over this, again, we know that it works. By the way, uh, being paranoid, let me make sure that all my tests are going to be working. So let me run all my tests. Shouldn't take a long time. And you should see that all of them work. That's also a nice thing about doing unit testing. You can try stuff. You will know if you broke things real fast. OK, next bit. Uh, what about performance? So now I've been doing all of this stuff. It was a lot of work. Was it really worthwhile? So guess what? Again, I have a performance session for that. Um, burp, burp, wait a moment. I think I need to go to another branch. Yes. So I need to go to this branch. Am I there yet? Yes, I'm there. Now, if I run this one and I want to show you the performance session, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be comparing also things like my value objects. I'm just going to do the equals over here. And again, I, I cannot run this live, but you, you, you will get a cooler from me, so you can always try that at home. Huh? But if you then look at the performance comparison, what we're going to find is, is that if I use like a hard-coded implementation, it takes four nanoseconds. If I take my implementation, it takes six nanoseconds. So it's a little bit slower, but really not that much slower, especially if you compare it to the Microsoft technique or using the naive reflection technique. Uh, so this is real fast. It's fast for objects that are equal. It's also fast for objects that are not equal. And again, we get similar performance. And this has a little bit of uh, error margin on it. So do not take all of this too literally. OK? Now, I would like to talk about another thing. In two weeks, less than two weeks, Microsoft is going to release .NET 5. And in .NET 5, we'll get access to C Sharp 9. And C Sharp 9 decided to add something new, a new kind of type. And they call that a record. I want you to think of this as a record being a reference type, but it has behavior of a value type. So this makes it very easy to build a value object. If I want to build a value object like I just had, I can just do it in C Sharp by saying public record my value object or C9 value object. And I can then say, please make first name a property, but I want you to make it a read-only property. Instead of having a getter and a setter, we get a get and an init. And init literally means you can set the property when you create an instance of value object. So I can now use a constructor to initialize it, or I can use a initialization list to initialize it. But once this property gets a value, you cannot change it anymore. And guess what? The equality on this thing also is implemented as a value object. So it will compare first name and last name and age. And only if all of them are equal, it's going to return true on the equal net. Now, I decided that looks interesting. Let's see how that one performs. So I did another performance session. And then I suddenly saw that if I use the record types from C Sharp 9 and literally the code you just saw, it is a little bit slower. And then I was like, hmm, why is this slower? Now, how can I figure out something like that? How can I see how C Sharp 9 generated the code for this record type? Well, guess what? For this, we have something called DN Spy. So I'm going to open up DN Spy. 
uh, oops, .NET Spy, uh, .NET Spy. Um, this is a free tool, you can download it and it will allow you to just click. Uh, well, what I can do is I can open up an assembly and I've already done that. So you click here, you open up an assembly, you look for it, one of the assemblies, it will be shown and then you can look at the namespaces, then you can look at the classes, then you can look at the methods in the class. And once in there, you can look at it using either intermediate language, but it's actually a little bit more comfortable to just look at the C-sharp code. And what you see here is that this equals method actually will just see if the other object is not null and if they're the same type and if the first name is the same, the last name is the same and the age is the same. And to be honest, I was really amazed that it is slower than my equivalent hard-coded class where I also have an equals, which kind of looks very similar. Wait a moment, is this the hard-coded? Yes. So this will check uh, first name versus last name and then check age. Okay. Now, I found it kind of weird that this was so much slower. Now, it did give me an idea because there is still something I can make better. So if you want to examine how something got generated, want to look behind the scenes a little bit, you can easily use .NET Spy to look at the colder and it's going to be nice enough for you to decompile everything. Now, how can I make it better? Well, I've done another thing. What I've done, uh, let me show you how I did this, is I went again into my application and I ran a new performance session. And that should be, I think, over here. What I've done is I've changed my test and I told my test to actually diagnose memory consumption. <clears throat> so when I then run this test, it will also show me how much memory was consumed. Uh, so that's the only thing I had to do. Tell it to use the memory diagnoser. So I just added this attribute and then all of this will now look at how much memory I'm consuming. And guess what the result was? Well, you can see it right here. <clears throat> My hard-coded comparer does not consume any memory. It just calls equals. But then if I look at the Microsoft and the reflected one, they were adding a lot of data. You might say, okay, this is not a lot, but if I call this a lot of times, this can add up really quick. But I did not expect my value object to also allocate a piece of memory because what am I doing there? I'm actually creating, uh, sorry, I'm just calling equals. And I did not know, hey, was I actually creating something? Now, uh, guess what? Let's have a look at the caller. So if you're going to look at the value comparer and then we look at this bit, what am I doing? I'm actually calling the equals method. And I'm calling the equals method that takes an object argument. What happens if I call equals with an int? It will box the int value. So this is a bad idea. I shouldn't have done that. Now, what is the solution? Well, you just kind of saw the solution with .NET Spy, but I, I want to explain it again. How can I solve it? Well, in a way, if you're going to be using an equality method, you're way better off calling this version called I equatable equals. And what does the I equatable equals do? Well, it actually just takes an object of the right type. So if I call equals with this an int, there is going to be no boxing. If I call equals with anything which is a value type, there's going to be no boxing. If I call equals here with a value type, there is going to be boxing. So we want to avoid that. And one way to avoid it is to use something called equality comparer. So next branch, if I look at equality comparer number six, if I do check out for this one, what we're going to see is that I rewrote things a little bit. What have I done? I said, please get me the property. And then I told it using reflection, please get me the class equality comparer, but I want you to fill in for me the T with the property type. So if I run this on first name, property type is string, so it's going to give me equality comparer of string. If I do the same thing for H, H is an int, 
This will give me a quality compare. And if I have another type, it will give me an equality comparer for that other type. So I can ask this one, please get me that type. I'm going to then ask, please get me the property default. And why do I need to do that? Well, sorry, but if you work with equality comparer, you're always going to have to write things like, hey, if equality comparer of int uh, dot instance, and then you can call equals on that. And then the advantage is, if I call this with an int, there is going to be no boxing. Ah, you might think boxing, that's not expensive. Hmm. Well, to be honest, in .NET 2, I'm talking about a long time ago, but .NET 2, they got a 40% speed enhancement just by removing all the boxing from the .NET framework. 40% faster by removing all the boxing. Because boxing will actually allocate very shortly data on the heap, which will make the garbage collector run more often. And that's really bad for performance. So that's what I want to do. I want to actually say, please get me the equality comparer. Now, please get me the default instance. And I can do that by saying, give me a compression, uh, sorry, give me an expression that will get the property default of this object. Uh, and then I'm actually going to call the equal method on that. So I'm saying, please get me the equal method on equality comparer of something. And that is going to take two arguments, both of the same type. So equality comparer of int takes an int and an int. And again, we don't have boxing. So then I'm going to turn that into an equal call. Uh, and I'm going to call that again, just like before. So this code uh, down below is exactly the same. So what I did, is I replaced this little, little bit of code with three more minutes. They might now think, hey, that's going to be slower. No, it's not. And this will actually be faster because I'm getting rid of boxing and I'm kind of following the flow of the .NET framework. So I build it. Again, I ran a performance session and guess what? I could actually get off and let me show you the difference these are two performance sessions on the same bit of code. If I remove the boxing, we get one nanosecond faster. And again, you might think, so what? Well, I'm getting pretty close to the hard-coded version. And now I can just build the value object. The only thing I need to do with that value object, I have to say, here is the equal. I can almost copy paste that. I just need to replace this with my type. Uh, and we have it. And that's all. And from now on, if I want to add a new property, this coder will dynamically just generate the equals. Every time I rerun my application, I will get the proper implementation of equality without losing any speed. Now you might think maybe could we do a, bit, a little bit better maybe? Well, I do have a little bit more time, so let's look at that. Once I started to think about this, I was saying, hmm, I'm calling this thing value object compare. And in .NET, we have actually something called equality compare of T. And I, I discovered that they were kind of in structure very similar. A generic class with a singleton. So I said, hmm, why don't I just follow the name the naming convention that they did so then finally to kind of make it better what i did is i went again and i have a new branch for that and again i will have to force checkout and i decided to just rename everything into what is equality comparer so instead of having value object comparer i have equality comparer for this type uh, so that's kind of a rename of everything. Now we could even go beyond that because I need to discuss another thing. If you want to have a get hash caller in .NET Core, we have this cool little class called hash caller and you just give it the properties and this will give you a hash caller for your object. Now again, if this is hard coded, if I add a new property to this class, I will have to update this bit and I will have to update this bit. Now, so guess what? We could do something very similar with this equality comparer to generate a hash caller live. 
And with that, I want to introduce something. One of the things that I've done recently is I've built a NuGet package, U2 Value Object Comparers, that will actually give you the ability to implement equality, but also the Git hash caller very efficiently. They both use the same technique. They use a reflection to then just once generate the proper caller. And from then on, we can call that caller just as if it was hard coded with near hard, hard coded performance. By the way, if you want to have a look at my demo caller, I've checked everything in into GitHub. So if you go to github.com slash Peter Himschot slash XL 2020, you can download my demo caller with all my branches and then you could replay this if you'd like to. Uh, so that means that I have some time for questions. Let me see if there are any questions yet. Um, apparently, I don't see any questions. So maybe this is a great time if you want to pose a question. So if there are no questions at all, please, free to, uh, please feel free to uh, maybe later send me an email uh, if you like, or you could contact the people from Visug and this way get your question to me. I hope you found this session interesting. So big summary is don't mind doing reflection, but just do it once. Cache everything or even better, generate code on the fly. Ah. ah, so I have a question. Why is the C sharp record type implementation so slow? I'm going to be honest with you. I have no idea. And guess who's going to be there this evening? Bartha Smet. And I think I'm going to uh, ask Bartha Smet. Maybe he, he can tell me a little bit more. If you look at the implementation, by the way, you see that this actually uses a equality contract either to, uh, equal to the other equality contract. And this is kind of the difference that I saw. I don't do this bit. So maybe it has to do with equality contract. But then if you look at this class, you see that it has a quality contract here somewhere, which is just a little property which returns the type. So I have absolutely no good idea why this is so slow. I guess, like I said, Bart is hopefully going to be able to, to give me a nice answer there. Okay. So if you have other questions, please send them to me right now. We still have some time. So another question, are there any good references for knowing what methods you need to build your expression? For example, a cheat sheet. Um, I did not find a good cheat sheet on this area. Uh, sometimes the end spy can be a little bit of assistance because with intermediate language, you could uh, look at the code in maybe a little bit lower format, but you kind of have to think as if you're the compiler. You have to think in, ah, this statement, what does it consist of? Oh, here I'm getting a property. Here I'm doing an and, here I'm doing this. And to be honest, sometimes trial and error. Uh, the whole implementation, not just this demo, but the, the full implementation, I did that on a couple of train rides between Ghent and Leuven. Uh, so, to be honest, just don't give up. Uh, there's always, uh, this, you just need to think like a compiler. You need to subdivide your statements into smaller parts until you go to the bottom parts. And then just, just do expression dot, and then you can look at the statements you might need. Okay. By the way, these expressions can also be used in other places. I don't know if you've heard of things like static reflection, but then you're, you're not generating code or you're just using the expression as a read-only data structure. 
to quickly discover things like the name of a property. Okay, did you use this method for more complex scenarios? Um, to be honest, the equality compare that I've been building there is probably one of the most complex one. I've been using this for some other scenarios. Uh, one of which maybe, I, okay, it's not really more complex. It's actually a bit simpler, but in, in that one, um, I'm, I'm wrapping an object so I can easily add I notify property change to any class uh, that doesn't have that interface. Um, so you can also use it combined with things like dynamics, but it's just more cool. Okay. I do want you to realize that it is a little bit of intensive, uh, it's a lot of labor to get something like this working 100%, but it's not impossible. There are, uh, for example, the new JSON serializer uh, probably uses techniques like this. Uh, they've been doing that before to optimize things that use a reflection and then just spit out the necessary color. Uh, and then that thing goes real fast. And then if you want to make it even faster, think about memory consumption. And that's why I added the boxing example. Uh, fast coder that does not allocate new memory is always faster than coder that has to allocate new memory. Okay, more questions, please. Okay, Peter? Yeah. All right, we will uh, stop here. Uh, if people have additional questions, they can get back to you. Uh, we'll terminate the session uh, here and uh, have a break. Okay, perfect. Oh, there's one more question coming in. Ah, there's one more question, nice. Oh, I didn't, uh, sorry, I need to scroll down. How does this compare to code generators to be all the hype today? Uh, well, uh, you could, at compile time, generate the code, like the hard code stuff. Um, and in many cases, this might be even a better solution. But sometimes you just don't know what kind of code to generate. By the way, if I would give you a library and then I would ask you, please use this code generator, it's going to be harder for you to use. Then if I just give you a library where I say, hey, just copy paste this or implement things like this, and then I'll figure it out at runtime. So the big difference is uh, the code generator that you can use will do it at compile time. Here I'm doing it at runtime, but uh, I hope to, sh to have shown that I can get the same performance. Okay. So I would use uh, my technique if, uh, if I build a library and I want to make it easy for people to use um, and then code generators, they're, they're excellent if you can integrate them into a tool. So both cases would be valid. All right, good. Okay. Let's close here. Thank you all for your attendance and Peter for presenting this. See you later. Bye-bye. My pleasure and bye-bye.